again, just use every opportunity that you have in life and to think of it as an opportunity and not think that you're going backwards. Think of it as just, you know, again, we talked about in the very beginning, you know, kind of this winding roads, right? Sometimes we go up and it's really clear and direct of what it is that we thought we want to do. And sometimes we feel we're not there. So when you're at that not there moment, or even when you are, just think of everything around you and just, just kind of start to internalize it and just be aware and, and take, you know, take pride in the moment and, and appreciate it because it's, it's gonna, it'll be useful later. Don't ever think negatively of what you're doing. Hey there, welcome to the Flit 360 podcast. I'm Dr. Heidi K. Begay, and I'm a flutist, educator, coach, and podcaster. My God-given mission is to serve you. I am passionate about guiding you, the modern-day flutist, to discover your unique voice on and off the stage. The goal of this podcast is to help you thrive both as an artist and as a musicpreneur. Go ahead and grab some espresso, your favorite notepad, and let's get to it. Today's episode 192 is titled, Conquer Your Unique Path with Stephanie Hollander. Hey there, Flute 360 er I hope you are doing well. This series that is going throughout the month of February and a little bit into the month of March is all about conquering your own path. Now, the reason why I wanted to talk to the experts about this is because I hear you. I've been doing some deep dives with flutists just like yourself who are barely making ends meet. And I'm sorry, that's not okay with me because I don't want you to survive, I want you to thrive. And you deserve that for yourself and for all the time and efforts you have put into your musical craft. If you are a professional musician and you want to carve your own path and you're not quite sure what that looks like, then I highly encourage you to schedule a 15 minute discovery call with me through the links in the show notes below. I would love to get to know you. I want to hear your passions, your dreams, your aspirations, your wants and your needs. I promise I do not bite and I promise that this is not a sales call. If you need to connect with me and you need to say, hey, Heidi, (laughs) I need a lending ear. I need you to listen to my pain points. I need to get expert advice on what to do next, then I will gladly tell you, yeah, let's work together. Let's work together through a flute lesson or a coaching call, or perhaps one of my classes could help you. But I don't want you over there with earbuds in your ears right now, banging your head against the wall time and time again, trying to get your career off the ground by yourself. My hand is raised. I have been there so many times, you do not have to go down the traditional path. And what you're going to find out through this series, listening to Sam, Stephanie, Kelly, Jared, John, and Angela, these musicians have forged their own paths and they tell you their stories. But I don't want it to stop there. I want you to be inspired. Yes, but inspiration only lasts a few minutes, a few moments in time. What you need to do to actually see real change within your career, whether you are a flutist, educator, adjudicator, digital course provider, whatever your cap is, in order to really start moving the needle forward for your career and for your business, you need to take actionable steps. So go ahead and schedule a call with me. I can't wait to get to know you that much better. Talk to you soon. Stephanie, hi. Hey, Heidi. How are you doing? Doing pretty well. How are you? Good, good. So pre-interview talk, you were talking about your weekend being uneventful. (laughs) 
super uneventful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like negative three degrees and stuck in the house and, you know, with two kids and the pandemic, there's nowhere to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you live in New York, correct? I do. Yep. Yeah. Been here That's like uh, seven or eight years now in New York. Okay. How are you liking it? Depends. I've lived in three different parts of New York. <laughs> so I think it just depends. You know, there's pros and cons to each area. I think where we live now, it's there's some nice things about it, but it's a little bit isolated. Would like to be, you know, a little bit more populated. But yeah, it's it's pretty nice. At least it's close to everything. I'm originally from Jersey, so you know, it's not too far from home. So not too bad. That's nice. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Funny story. Well, not funny story, but story, just to kind of bring the listeners up to speed. Stephanie and I met actually about a year, year and a half ago. It's been a while. And she was so kind to help me with paperwork to do a presentation at Hartwick College in New York. It was a remote presentation. And my girlfriend slash colleague, Dr. Ana Laura Gonzalez, is the flute professor there. And so we were setting up a presentation and Stephanie handled all of the paperwork and the scheduling and everything. And come to find out, Stephanie and I have a lot in common. <laughs> like and, being cat moms. <laughs> yeah, we're cat moms. <laughs> You're not as crazy. You have two. I have four. Oh, I had three at one point. Okay. Okay. Whew, I feel a little better. <laughs> I always cringe when I tell people I have four cats because I even hear how crazy that is in my own head. And when I spew it out, I'm like, ooh, what are they going to think about me? (laughs) So thank you. Bless your heart for being kind. (laughs) Uh, But two of them is, they're not my fault. Literally, it was all the pandemic's fault. Because they were strays. They were starving at my doorstep. I'm like, Eric and I are home all the time. Sure, I will adopt two more. What's two more? (laughs) Well, they say it's it's better to do that, actually, you know, even it out. There you go. (laughs) My horn professor from Eastman, he would have agreed with that. I never forget. I was like, I had one cat at the time and I was debating getting another one. And he was like, yeah, he needs a friend. Get another one. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. I was reading an article and I was contemplating whether or not I should adopt these two. And basically this article said, don't have more cats in your house than you have hands. So I was like, well, I have two hands. My husband has two hands. That's four. You're hurt. You're set to go. (laughs) (laughs) So five is when it's, you know, at the cup of crazy, or I just need to grow another limb. (laughs) Isn't that wonky? That is so wonky. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, shoot. But as you can see, Stephanie and I have amazing synergy and the friendship is just like it blossomed so quickly. And I'm so thankful. Like I was so thankful to have that opportunity to speak at Hartwick. But this is why I do what I do, because in the process of teaching and reaching out to people and growing a community, I met a new friend that I never thought was possible or that there was a Stephanie in New York. And here we are recording your episode. And so it's just mind blowing to me. Yeah. And thanks for having me. I'm so excited. (laughs) Oh yeah, you're welcome. Well, speaking of which, I actually got really, really pumped for this morning because you're the first, well, actually you're the second French hornist. Ooh. On a flute show. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, you know, when I was in music ed at the time, they always told us that the best transition of French horn were flute players. No way. Yeah, because of the embouchure. And so um, oh. if, there, if there's any uh, music educator or teachers out there that can justify for that, love to hear it. I didn't get that far in the music ed trail. <laughs> wow, I've never heard that before. Yeah. Very cool. I learned something new. <laughs> so actually, the first French hornist on Flute 360 was Adam Wolf. So yeah. I don't know the episode number off the top of my head, but <laughs> we were talking about podcasting. So that's awesome. But anyways, so since this is a new series, we are going to be talking about pain points that you and I have noticed throughout our own careers, pain mm-hmm. points that our students are experiencing and what we're doing to overcome those obstacles. And then I'm going to pick your brain about like 
how you mentor your students, because sometimes I hit a roadblock within my own coaching niche of what I do. So first and foremost, though, I think it's imperative that people get to know you. We know you're a French (laughs) hornist and you live in New York, but feel free to share a little bit more about yourself. Yeah. So my name is Stephanie and I was a professional student for a while. I did my undergrad at University of Cincinnati and my master's at Eastman School of Music. After my master's, I decided I still needed some more time to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. Is this, you know, I started off at Cincinnati actually as a double major in performance and education. So when I first started there, I thought, oh, I'm going to go down the music ed trail because I come from a whole family of music educators, my mom, my dad, my sister, my brother. And so I thought that's what I was going to do. Then, you know, towards the end, I decided to drop music education and focus on performance. But then when I got to Eastman, I don't know, I was confused. I I felt, you know, maybe I want to take auditions, but I'm not really feeling it. I feel like I still needed more time. So I ended up doing a two-year fellowship at Bard College, which was great because it gave me two years to kind of not worry about anything. It was a full ride plus a stipend and I had great teachers and I got to focus and I got to move to the Hudson Valley, which is super beautiful, great for hiking, everything. And I was going again down this road. I want to go down to my doctor because I don't want to teach higher ed or I want to take auditions. And so uh, it was Hudson Valley where I kind of started uh, slowly freelancing started making connections. I think I just moved there at the right time. Seems like there were some horn players in the area and then they kind of retired. And so I was collecting private students and I was able to take over in some of the local community orchestras. So it kind of just, you know, worked efficiently. And so I kind of decided I really want to take this audition round and become focused on the performance end. So I ended up doing professional studies at Manhattan School of Music after that. And I commuted to New York City for a year and I loved it. Um, My teacher was amazing, Javier Gandara, and just was like, yeah, this is where I'm at. But then the real world kind of (laughs) stuck. And, you know, it was, there was a lot of hard stuff, you know, so freelancing, it was great. Like I was getting calls to go down to Florida. um, And I think that's kind of where it all started. It was like, First, it was kind of some trauma because, you know, one of my first really big gigs, I was like, wow, this is like, you know, I'm kind of starting getting started in this world. And, you know, the people I were playing with were not so nice. They were, you know, I think I got brought down, you know, as a female for some of the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people were uh, mentally abusive and it was scarring. And then, you know, the financial struggles of trying to pay the bills and trying to take auditions and, just traveling all the time, you know, I was like, then I started kind of second guessing everything again. Um, Mm. So then I said, you know what, I want to go the doctorate route, then started playing for doctor programs for three straight years. And I'm the first to tell everyone that I just, I have struggled with test anxiety. Um, Mm. And so the entrance exams were a huge struggle for me, even though I knew what I wanted to focus my dissertation on, I got accepted into the music program, but they were not willing to accept me based on my entrance exam scores. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of from just kind of being back at square one, and I kind of started just kind of looking at, um, you know, uh, different, trying to see a trend, I guess one could say, in job postings for higher ed. And I was like, all right, well, I need two, three years experience, essentially, if I don't have a doctorate. And so that's kind of when this whole adventure kind of just started of creating opportunities for myself. And so, I got some adjunct positions and still created on the freelance trail. But, you know, as you said, in terms of just like some pains that come from it, it has not been an easy road, you know, Um, especially, you know, right before it was like going really great and kind of hanging on. And then the pandemic just kind of opened eyes about everything. You know, my most recent gig, I got there, I forgot the music just because out of routine of everything, (laughs) Uh, left it on my kitchen table which one would be like, okay, yeah, that's your responsibility, but hey, it happens, right? And the librarian starts literally jumping up and down and screaming and cursing. Are you kidding me? And, you know, the people I was playing with were just, I don't know, it just wasn't as a welcoming environment as one would want to coming off of almost like, you know, from March, 2020 to not playing a gig and being your first gig back and you're kind of excited and not the kind of experience you want to have. Yeah. No, thank you first and foremost for being so honest and open and vulnerable. Like the honesty, thank you, Stephanie, seriously, because these discussions, 
there's something that I want to have more of with people like you to bring this stuff to light because we know that we're not the only ones walking a similar course. There are more musicians out there walking a very similar journey, but we don't hear about it. It feels very kind of hush-hush or we feel ashamed when things don't go the way we planned, et cetera, right? Yeah. And so when you talked about your journey from like undergraduate, graduate, you know, pre-DMA, what I saw was somebody who was so driven and tenacious. And you know those like Facebook memes or this the pictures that you see where it's like where you are and then your goal. And then we think it's this arrow, straight arrow, but it's not. And it's like, you go, you know, through cliffs up and down and swirl and up and, you know, valleys, mountaintops. And what I want to ask you is whenever your path kind of got diverted, it sounded like you were so driven and tenacious to say, okay, that didn't work. Let me be creative and let me see what could work. Because it sounded like you were problem solving and finding creative solutions along the way. Does that resonate with you? It's exactly it. And okay. you know, it's funny you say that because you're like the second person within the same month to say that out loud to me about it without me even realizing that's how I do it. But you know, you know, I just had a, a child and you know, chose to formula fed, but there's a formula shortage. And so I was explaining about, you know all this different, I'm already being proactive kind of essentially of what to do in case I can't find it. And she said the same exact thing about my personality. So I guess you're right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, it's, to me, it's really evident. And I respect that because, well, one, you know, coming from two different perspectives from another professional, um, it gives me inspiration and motivation to keep going and to say, okay, stop. It feels like Yes, it's not going the way you you had planned, but there's always a plan B, C, D, E, Mm -hmm. all the way to Z. (laughs) But then from the perspective as a mentor, where I can feed my students and say, you know what, I've given you my life examples, but listen to Stephanie and her example, because a lot of times what happens is like, as you know, as an educator, you feed your students, you know, stories from your life over and over again. But And it sits with them. It resonates with them, right? But then sometimes if they hear Carol's story or Stephanie's story or Joe's story or then it clicks, then they're like, oh, I get what Heidi was saying. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And And I think that's why we need these interactions and these dialogues because that's how we connect the dots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I commend you on that. So if there's somebody who is in a similar situation, say they are in college or grad school, it doesn't matter where you are along your path, right? So I don't care if it's Summit 2 or Summit 20. That element and that characteristic of your personality of how you persevere, is there a piece of advice for that person who is like on the squiggly part of their path and it's not necessarily the straight and narrow? You know, I think the biggest thing is being in the present and understanding where you're at. So rejection is going to happen. And I think learning to accept rejection is a big part and to not let it kind of deter you because I think, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And I think it is about just kind of being a little bit more, as you said, creative, right. And about how you're going to find it. And so also just kind of being, you know, more lenient on yourself. If it didn't happen this year, that doesn't mean it's never going to happen. I think when I created a program, that allowed me opportunities to kind of start networking and getting out there and, and starting to help younger musicians um, called Graduation Now What. One of the things I talked about was levels of success. And, and that by kind of just being, you know, especially starting with age, I think, you know, we kind of get to tiered when we're in school that we think that if we haven't won an audition yet, we're not succeeding. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I got out into the freelance scene and also from my teacher, Javier Gandara at Manhattan School of Music, who pointed out to me that most people don't win their first big job until their late 30s, early 40s. And when I started freelancing, I kind of started realizing how much on the younger tier, even though I was like 26, 27, how much on the younger tier I actually was when I didn't feel that way from the beginning. So I think, yeah, I think it's being in the present and and just learning to kind of just know that it's okay. This, this happens, but it's not the end of the world. It's, you know, there's, there's going to be a different light. And I think it's like doing what we're doing, you know, right. We meet new people and Mm -hmm. 
it gives a new light of motivation and it opens up a new door of resources. Exactly. Yes. And when you said the H factor, I really resonated with that because I had a teacher way back, way back. And I was like 18, 20. And I remember them telling me, well, have you figured out what you want to do on your musical path? I said, well, I have some ideas. And it was in terms of like competitions and winning competitions. And I remember them saying, well, you're 20. And if you haven't won a competition, you're too old. You're you're too old. You're already dried up. And I'm like, are you serious? You know, and when now coming into my 30s and through social media, you see people like piccolo players and flute players and other instrumentalists saying, I won my first job and I connect their age now. And I'm like, wait a second, they're (laughs) mid-30s, 40s. What the heck? Yeah, it's (laughs) mind-blowing. Right. And so, and then when I see like the orchestras, you know, with all the white and gray hair, you know, and they're still creating, they're still putting themselves out there. I'm like, okay, you know, like you get to determine when you're done. You get to determine when you're dried up. You get to determine when you don't want to take those shots anymore. Exactly. It has nothing to do with a number. Exactly. And and even if you decide to take a break and come back to it, you know, it's still going to be there. And I think for me, just personally in my life, you know, I had, I got hit by a car and, you know, I had a lot of PTSD from it and that was a turning point. I think that, but I think if anything, I'm grateful from that of learning was that, you know, the horn was still going to be there. Music was still going to be there, even though I had Mm -hmm. to take time off. And I think a lot of people can start Mm -hmm. to resonate that now with the pandemic, right? I think a lot of people, I keep seeing a lot of people who haven't been practicing, who haven't been as motivated. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see that it's okay that that happened. And it's okay because we're going to get back to it and everyone's going to get back to it on their own time. Yeah. You can't pick up where you left off. I have to tell that to myself every day because I am such an all or nothing gal. (laughs) (laughs) If the hundred page book wasn't written today, oh, well then. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I don't even try. it's It's like, no, you've written five pages. Say those five pages were written a year ago. Well, guess what? You can pick up where you left off. And that's like my mantra that I have to remind myself, because if not, it's just going to be all or nothing. And I know that's not healthy. Yeah. So going back to like, okay, so like you went to school, there's pain points, you're a professional now. And even when you have gotten the gig, you know, playing with orchestras or working in academia, It's not sometimes, like, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's not always better on the other side. There's always going to be obstacles, right? So it sounds like even though you do have, you are freelancing, it sounds like you also have traditional jobs too. But in a way, like, I'm getting a sense of you asking yourself, like, how can I create opportunities on my own terms in Mm -hmm. the sense of who I want to work with, what I want to work on? Does that kind of connect with your reality? Yeah. So okay. I think I'll back up a little bit. And, you know, I think in my intro, I forgot to, what am I actually doing in the present life right now? So I do freelance as a professional musician and I teach privately. I'm adjunct horn professor at uh, Bard College for the music department and Hartwick College. And also I teach music appreciation at SUNY Duchess in the Hudson Valley. And I'm also a full-time career coach um, in career development. And so, yeah, I think in the beginning to kind of go backtrack a little bit, I definitely started creating, you know, it's funny when I think about it, because I never really interviewed for everything. And it's funny because here I am in career development right now. I'm kind of getting a little windy in my thing, but it'll all connect together Uh, in career development right now. And here I am, I'm coaching students on how to interview, how to get ready for jobs. And when I think about it, I didn't actually do any of that. (laughs) Um, I struggled so hard because, you know, I got asked to teach adjunct at SUNY Duchess first and that was just because I reached out to them. I got connected with their community music school first. So, you know, I think just getting your resume out anywhere and everywhere possible is because it starts to get your name out. Um, and then I did finally contact them and said, I'm happy to teach any courses. And eventually they had something open for me. 
And then, you know, Bard College, it was a similar thing. The horn teacher left. They needed someone. I went there. So it kind of fell into place. And Hartwick also, too, my predecessor, Josh, Joshua Thompson, he also um, he offered this to me. So those kind of things, you know, I, I think I got lucky with. Um, but then I had to kind of realize, well, um, 2019, I had my first child and, you know, I was getting exhausted. I was mm. <laughs> running around everywhere. I think within two and a half years, I put on 90,000 miles in my car. And that's just how much running around and to pick up the pieces that I wasn't making from freelancing or adjunct teaching. Um, I was waitressing. I was working at 5 a.m. at the YMCA. I was babysitting. I was doing everything, anything because I needed financial stability, too. And that was the only way that I could kind of mishmash it all together. But let me tell you, it was exhausting. Yeah. And so. So when the pandemic hit and I hit everything, I, you know, I've been applying for lots of jobs. I was just trying to see like, what can I use from what I do to apply for things? Um, So I was applying for like academic advisor positions and and I couldn't get passed down any single resume round. It felt like an audition, honestly, I was frustrated. I must've been applying for over a hundred jobs literally. And so then I was up here at Harvard College and they created this new program called Flight Path. And someone uh, that I work with mentioned, you should check out some of these new things. And one thing led to another and it it opened, it opened this opportunity. But now I feel like I am, as you said, trying to create opportunities still, even though I am okay, I'm full-time now, mm-hmm. but I don't want to just leave music behind because that's still a huge part of I am. And so there's a lot that I'm doing in between the scenes to kind of still keep that going. And so hmm. it's pretty exhausting, but I feel like for what I want professionally. It's, it's kind of what's needed at the time. Yeah. No, it sounds more sustainable than 90,000 miles in two months. <laughs> yeah. I live two blocks now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy for you. <laughs> I resonate with that because from master's to my DMA for six years, I was teaching 50 flute students and not one came to my house. Wow. Zip, 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 zip. You know, it's I exhausting. literally, it's exhausting. And I knew in my mind, like, this is not sustainable. I need to get that DMA so I can get that full time <laughs> job. <laughs> right. So, yeah, the miles on my Hyundai Elantra, that added up pretty quick. And I actually found an old mile tracker log, like those little books. <laughs> We, we just moved from Fort Worth to Dallas, and I found one of those tracker books from, like, 2013. Oh I was like, gosh. oh, bless your heart, young <laughs> Heidi. <laughs> there's scribbles, and there's doodles, and there's, like, coffee stains. I'm like, oh, my, oh gosh. my gosh. I cannot. I can't fathom. <laughs> yeah. And then what you said, too, about the 100 applications. Thank you for saying that out loud, because when I tell people, like, from 2018, when I graduated with my DMA, to 2020, it was hundreds of applications. And people think that I'm literally fibbing and I'm not. Mm -mm. And it is, you're right. It's just like an audition. I mean, it is an audition, but it's just as grueling and just as competitive as an audition. Mm -hmm. And I think this brings us to maybe an observation of the industry. There are too many overly qualified musicians with degrees who are well-skilled at their craft, but not enough jobs to go around. What I imagine is hundreds of thousands of musicians are fighting for one or two jobs. And I think we need to start shifting this mindset of having, you know, like maybe pulling back the blinders a little bit and noticing more opportunities are all around us rather Mm -hmm. than those one or two jobs. How does that sit with you? Yeah. I mean, you know, being on the faculty side okay, and just knowing how hard it is to get a full-time faculty position, even if you do get past that resume round, right. Even if you do get a job, right. And you get adjunct to get full-time and it's a dime in the dozen. And then, you know, another thing you have to choose is like, what's important to you in life, right? Because I guess if I wanted to move out to the Midwest, maybe it would be easier. I would have more opportunities, but I wasn't willing to make that move. And now being on the staff end of things and just seeing how much staff they go through in and out of people um, Uh in higher ed. And yeah, I think it's, it's a lot of that. And similar to auditions, they go through the whole process to only 
not hire anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Or a position that's open and it's open for like months and months. And it's like, why haven't you finalized and set, we could really use that extra hand. And it's, you know, you know, financial cuts and timing and people are just, you know, they're, they're shorthanded. So. Yeah. I think what we're saying is we're recognizing like the music industry is shifting, like the job market is shifting mm-hmm. and kind of what you and I talked about, like, pre-recording talk last (laughs) week is that what was true and what our teachers are instructing us and how they are advising us, like they mean well, they're doing phenomenal work. I just want to put out a huge disclaimer, but what worked for them 20, 30, 40 years ago is not necessarily the current climate. And I think that's the message that we're trying to get out there is to say, okay, we need to recognize the problem at hand. And what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. You know, and so going back to like my 100 applications, right? It was anywhere in the world, right? And I could, because you mentioned geography, you mentioned like Midwest really wasn't an option for you. So for me, I was applying to pretty much anything worldwide because, and only because I don't have kids. At the time, we did not have a mortgage. And my husband owns a remote business. So the only thing that would stop our financial streams coming in and out is if we did not have access to the internet. So it was funny during those two years when I was applying to things, Eric was like, just make sure that you are applying to jobs that have a good stream of internet, you know, (laughs) because that was our bread and butter. We had set up an audio video production company during the three years as I was getting my doctorate. Wow. So he literally had clients, we had clients all across the globe from musicians who needed work on their music albums to remote concerts to podcasters who needed ums and ahs taken out of there, <laughs> <laughs> very much like today, um, but taking out the weird pauses and silences out of podcast episodes. So all that's to say is we had built that up for three years. And that takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. We did not, and we could not afford for that to go away. So the funny story in all of this is Eric was just like, anywhere but China. Because China, (laughs) as you know, has internet regulations. You can get on, but only so many hours. There's some certain websites you can't access, et cetera. Well, lo and behold, where did I get a full-time position offered to me? China. (laughs) (laughs) And you're right. And this is where it is the kicker. I was willing. So it was a two-year contract. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be obedient. I really felt called to go there for various reasons. And to justify the two years of being unemployed, to justify my 20 years of working on a doctorate, Like from 13, I said, I'm going to be Dr. Heidi one day. And I graduated (laughs) at 33 with my doctorate and I was Dr. Heidi. So for 20 years, you have this goal, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you are turned upside down, topsy-turvy for two years, applying to hundreds of jobs, you're like, what gives? What is this, right? And then you finally, at the end of it, are offered a full-time job. And you're like, yes, okay. But it's like the Midwest thing. But... I had to be willing to put my family on pause to be away from. So literally we were deciding, okay, that means that Eric has to stay in the States yeah, because there's no way that we could afford to drop everything that we worked towards JK media productions. It was just not an option. So I was willing to literally leave my husband behind for two years just to get a full-time flute job at an international school on my resume That's dedication. That, yeah. <laughs> or it's a little craziness is what it is. <laughs> in order to then be more marketable back into our industry, thinking, oh, if I had an international title, how much more would my, you know, would eyes get onto my resume? Right. Well, I think it was a godsend because the pandemic happened and that job was taken away from me only because I couldn't physically get over there. International travel just completely came to a halt. Right. So all that's to say is, you know, and it kind of brings me up to my friend's story too, Wally Wallace. Long story short, if you guys want to listen to Wally Wallace's episode through the Pivoting Musician, he talks about 
He's a saxophonist. He has this doctorate. He got into academia, 10-year track. And then he noticed that that job title was asking him to not uphold his priorities. Mm -hmm. Like his priorities were to take care of his family, to be there after school, to watch his children grow up for after school activities. And his job literally was taking him away from those priorities. So long story short, he just decided to pivot and said, you know what? No, like I'm not going to jeopardize my marriage. I'm not going to jeopardize the well-being of my children just so I can get ahead. Right. Kind of like the China thing, like, what am I going to do? What am I going to sacrifice? And you mm-hmm. think about it, you know, now that it's been two years since that job offer, you know, had to go away, it's now 2022. And I think of that often, like, what kind of strain would that have put on my marriage? Yeah. Like Eric and I are very tight knit, you know, like we've been married now close to 14 years. So at the time it was 12 years. We had a very strong, we do have a very strong relationship, but what yeah. would an international job have done to like the thing that I cherish most in this world. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So anyways, so all of this, we are recognizing that things are shifting. Things probably need to shift in order for the welfare of musicians, for the betterment of their lives and their careers. And what our mentors went through 20, 30 years ago, is just not our reality. So because you are a career coach, how are you advising students to make these changes and like, what's the next thing that we do? So we, I, we have identified the, the problem. I'm using yeah. air quotes. We've <laughs> identified the problem and what do we do? Like, what's the next step? So that way we can start making changes. Yeah. So, you know, I think my favorite when students come to me are the ones who are like, I absolutely have no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> okay. And, you know, they're sitting there, let's say they are a music major or maybe they're an English major, you know, the same talk is going to be applied. So it doesn't matter on the major okay? because I'm seeing it all across the board at industries. You know, maybe, yes, there are some industries like nursing or, you know, business where it's a little easier to get a job, but more or less the sales things apply. So hmm. first and foremost, it's, you know, what I'm going to say to them is, okay, you're, let's let's say we're talking to a music major, you know, um, you know, you are a music major, you like music, we understand that. So what are all the things that you are really passionate about? So, you know, are you passionate about dogs? Are you passionate about being vegan? Are you passionate about, you know, social justice issues? Starting to think kind of on those topics. And then it kind of also starts to kind of help a trend, like, to kind of see, do you want to go the performance route or do you want to go the education route? And then even within those directions, there's a lot of different tiers that you can take. So also kind of just being really well aware of what skills you're strong at. You know, do you speak other languages? You know, are you more someone that works better working remotely or, you know, you have a lot more technical skills and, you know, then kind of just qualities of life. Do you want to be by yourself? Do you want to work with a lot of people? And then kind of going from there, you can start to kind of filter and start to create what is going to be an idealistic career pathway for yourself. So let's kind of use an example. So let's say I, you know, I come to you and, you know, I'm talking out loud and I'm saying, you know, I want to do music performance. I know I want to perform. I'm not really committed to doing auditions and, and, and all that. So what else can I do besides just, you know, freelancing, which is also hard to make income. So, you know, I am a music major. Um, I love languages. I love uh, history and I love learning about different cultures. So we'll start to kind of team up. And I think, you know, you and I talked about this last week as well is about, using people that you do know who have stronger assets than you do to kind of team up with someone to kind of create something. And so, you know, you know, maybe there's a historic uh, nonprofit in town that uh, you can kind of, you know, talk with them and kind of pitch an idea about, I would love to do a set series of performances about, I don't know, Let's, I'm going to use, you know, we were just talking about the Native Americans and now I'm really intrigued, you know, yeah. about the history of Native Americans. And we're going to do a set series um, and I'm going to collaborate with your, your people because, you know, they're going to start helping with the finances. They're going to help get you the people and you can work on that artistic career pathway that you like 
and you know, there you are, you're performing. So I think it's, you know, being Mm open-minded too is also a huge element. Yeah. No, your students are so lucky to have you to help navigate them to see what those opportunities and what those possibilities are. Mm -hmm. As you were talking and you're using yourself as a guinea pig, I was thinking, ooh, I need to have Stephanie sit down and like pick my (laughs) brain. (laughs) Can somebody look at my pile of mess and tell me what I'm doing, please? (laughs) Oh my gosh. Never too late, right? (laughs) Nope. I'm going to hire you and be like, all right, Stephanie, (laughs) we need to have a (laughs) one-on-one. No, that's amazing. And there's a lot of gold nuggets in in there that I want to pull out. But the one that I want to pull out the most is you're helping students realize that you're giving them permission to dream big and you're giving them permission to say, let's examine the set of skills that you are good at. Like Mm -hmm. you are good at being organized. You are good with technology. Yes, you're good at playing your horn or your flute, but maybe not necessarily in an ensemble, like a huge orchestra, things like that. You can still cobble together these elements and then create your own thing without needing it to fit within a already set up like cookie cutter placement, right? Yeah. And, you know, even if, okay, let's say, you know, even if you are kind of still, you don't want to create something on your own and you want to still apply for something that's set in stone, it's still super helpful to know what skills and what passions you're good at and where your strong assets are. Because like, for instance, one of my good friends was applying for an adjunct position. And I said, really take a look at what they're looking for, you know, Mm. in the job posting. And so, you know, some of the things that were kind of big to them were recruitment and and it's like, you know, you know, start to kind of just brainstorm from what you do and how you can mm. carry that over to help them in something creative and new and different. And so, um, you know, maybe there's new courses of stuff that you like, like you love talking about Baroque Gobo. So maybe you can create a course there, you know, trying to also, it's a lot of doing research too, and just kind of being on top of the game. Yeah, no, I love that. And last week's talk, you brought up a really interesting element of negotiation. Hmm. Yeah. That's, yeah. And I think you're kind of hinting at it just a little bit here within like, you know, looking at applications and stuff. So say you did get this traditional job, you know, and there are certain things that you need to meet. But you mentioned last week about like, hey, you know, if you are passionate about the broke oboe or, you know, that example you just gave, how can you bring your passions to the table? How can you bring that to your job title so that way you feel creatively fulfilled? that you Mm -hmm. feel like you're bringing your talents to the table, right? So negotiation, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, negotiation is (laughs) not going to lie. It's something I'm very timid about. I'm just not, I I hate confrontation. I, I don't like it, but if there's anything that I've been learning as I've been in this role in career development, which is like huge for actually going to be in, and I'm, I'm learning a lot is negotiation is actually more common than we think. I mean, think about for any students that are listening here, you know, it could be something as simple as, you know, on campus, you know, maybe about a grade that you got in a class and you're trying to negotiate with your professor about the grade, or Mm -hmm. maybe it's a a work study position, you know, maybe about the amount of hours that you're doing or, you know, anything in that light. But um, to kind of go back to what I'm saying is what I'm kind of realizing is, there is a time and place also, I think, you know, it's not like, oh, you get hired and you have to negotiate right away. But, you know, maybe there is a small window that allows you to. But hmm. I've been one year in this position and it allows me the opportunity because I've been here one year. I've been able to kind of show, you know, what I can do and everything like that. It allows me to see what's missing here. And so it allows me to kind of, I miss teaching. I miss being in the classroom full time more I, when I was doing adjunct pretty much more consistently versus, you know, now just like once a week or anything like that. I was five days. So for me, it's like, wow, well, you know, the art students could use more support. And I think it's a great way to get exposure. And so because of recent mm-hmm. lights, I'm able to kind of negotiate with, you know, the upper divisions about trying to create courses on campus that I can teach about the arts. So it's allowing me to kind of use things that I'm still passionate about, things that I want to work on 
in a, in a different angle. And then, you know, it's also kind of just realizing. So I know that they have budget issues. I know that, you know, it's a common trend in higher ed, right? They're always saying, oh, we don't have enough money. We can't increase their salary. But, you know, there is always money hidden somewhere or in something. And so, you know, I kind of said, I said, well, trial and error. I said, just give me a stipend, you know? So it's like, I'm not expecting much, but just to acknowledge that there would be a thing, that's a first step in kind of negotiating. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I think you can't be timid, but I wouldn't say, you know, be nasty about it or be mean or, or expect a lot. But I think there's a starting point that, you know, give a little and give a little back. Yeah, no, I love that. And it kind of goes with this whole theme of today's talk. And that is not everything is black and white. Mm-mm. Right. You know, there's there's more room for flexibility. There's more room for creativity. There's more room for giving yourself permission to ask questions like, can we negotiate this? You know, and I think perhaps and I don't want to make a blanketed statement, but I think perhaps like maybe most not all, but maybe most music schools don't really train students to think outside of the box away from their instrument. Like we're Mm -hmm. taught to think creatively, like how to get a certain timbre or tone through our instrument, how to maybe problem solve a passage. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's really interesting. I think when, if we were just to kind of open up our eyes and going back to this like blinder analogy, just open up our blinders just a little bit, using those same skills that we use and hone towards our instruments, but then kind of picking them up and shifting them over to negotiations with jobs, like being really creative with, you know, those opportunities or like Mm -hmm. being really creative in cobbling together a career that fits well for your schedule and your family lifestyle and where you want to live in the country. Right. I'm trying to connect the dots from our, from our entire conversation. This is the theme that I keep seeing pop up. Yeah. And I think the kind of, you know, hit a little bit more about that you kind of go back to when I'm working with my students, right? What is the first thing? And I think that goes back to, again, this idea of researching the things. So if you are taking an audition for an orchestra, let's use that example, kind of research more about that orchestra. You know, how many performances are they doing a year? Who's on their board? Is it volunteered services? Is it people outside? You know, start to kind of think more about what's their mission and Then from there, you know, let's say you get the audition, you win, okay. Or maybe it's between two people. You never know, right? But let's say you do, you win the audition. You're one of the lucky ones. And it could be a small orchestra, right? You know, they only do three concerts a year. Well, you can say, listen, I have experience in grant writing. So, you know, I can help you guys get more exposure during the year. Um, We can get a couple of grants and maybe we can do some chamber music concerts, in the local schools or in the local community, you know, about X, Y, Z. Um, so, you know, there's one example there, or, you know, maybe you can say, listen, I am fluent in Spanish. So if you would like to have a concert for, you know, undocumented immigrants and, and stuff like that, I can help with the translation, you know, just need help. So it's again, kind of using your skills and things that you're good at and what you're passionate about to kind of help offset different experience and opportunities. And so not only helping yourself, right, because that could open up a doorway, but then they're going to like that because that's going to have an advantage to them. So Hmm. like, you know, my nursing students, you know, I always say when you apply for a position, let's say at a hospital in like, say, Boston, right, you know, what is that hospital missing? And this kind of goes to this like Hmm. buzzword of diversity and inclusion too, a little bit, not to get off track, but just to kind of point out another negotiation factor saying, Hmm. listen, you don't have anyone in your hospital that is fluent in speaking Spanish. And I took three years of Spanish. I have semi-conversational Spanish. I can really help you with that community that's not being served in your hospital because you're lacking this. So Mm -hmm. you kind of see how that kind of mishmash is together. And it's the same thing in higher ed. Oh, I love that. So what I'm hearing too is like, you have to see a need. And the fact that perhaps, you know, your stack of skills could actually fulfill that need. Mm -hmm. And then not only recognizing it, but then saying, okay, let me get creative. How can I bring this to the table? But then you have to be the initiator. Right. Don't wait for an opportunity just to fall in your lap and be like, oh, wow, I've got this amazing like Spanish-English hybrid nursing job at the hospital. 
Right. But you don't wait for somebody to actually say, you know, oh, wow, you do this and this and this Mm -hmm. here, like package it together yourself and bring it to the table. Because the worst that can happen is that they say no. Exactly. And that's it. You tried. And and, and I think that's the the big thing. I think people are scared to try. Okay. And I think, you know, what you just resonated with me when you talk about our mentors and our, you know, I do see schools where they're like somewhat teaching all this kind of stuff. They're allowing people to kind of get out of the box more, but it's not as committed and it's not like they give them somewhat of the tools that they need, but it's still just like, you know, we still want to kind of, I feel like the schools are still in this. We want to be able to boast about what people have done. And okay. just because it has, doesn't have that large title doesn't mean that you're still not doing it, even if it's like more concrete and a little kind of mixed in the pot. Mm, yeah. No, I love this conversation, Stephanie. And I love the fact that it's very apparent to me how much you have this love and desire and passion to serve students and saying, hey, you know, like you're at school and you're teaching how to play your instrument well, which rightfully so. We need to play the right notes on the page (laughs) in tune and in time. That's a real thing. But then when you get into the real world and you start noticing that, you know, the industry might be a little different than what they portrayed or the job market, it's it's always fluctuating. Change is inevitable. Change Mm -hmm. is the constant. (laughs) There's no such thing as constant other than change. And then how can we equip our students, right, to Mm -hmm. recognize these things, meet the needs that are out there in a very unique way with their unique stack of skills, and then feel creatively fulfilled and monetarily fulfilled, And that's what we want. This is the message for this entire series is like this right here. And you've been on both sides of the fence or all the sides of the fences (laughs) (laughs) in, out, up, down. And that passion for you to connect with students and say, hey, you know, we're on this other side of the fence. We're we're taking an amplifier. We're like, hello, like this is what the reality is. Like, let's start talking about this stuff so that way people can be more successful so that way they can thrive and that way they're not like hit by a bus and totally blindsided and like oy vey like what the heck nobody mentioned this to me and so you gave some really tangible things today about seeking out opportunities being really creative negotiating and I thank you for your expertise and your time you are you're such a blessing in my life so thank you for <laughs> offering your words of advice to the listeners today. No, thank you. And you know, if there's just one more thing that I can add, that is to not think that anything that you're doing is not, you know, one of the buzzwords is transferable skills or an opportunity because, you know, people will think even just working at McDonald's because that's what they need to do or babysitting. Or in my case, I was waitressing that is still a form of networking and still a form of exposure. So when I was waitressing, I carried my business cards on me all the time. And next thing I know, I was waiting week on week on with the director of the Culinary Institute. And I was able, because we had a great connection, left my card. They helped get me a gig at the Culinary Institute. So again, just use every opportunity that you have in life and to think of it as an opportunity and not think that you're going backwards. Think of it as just, you know, again, we talked about in the very beginning, you know, kind of this winding roads, right? Sometimes we go up and it's really clear and direct of what it is that we thought we want to do. And sometimes we feel we're not there. So when you're at that not there moment, or even when you are, just think of everything around you and just, just kind of start to internalize it and just be aware and, and take, you know, take pride in the moment and, and appreciate it because it's, it's gonna, it'll be useful later. Don't ever think negatively of what you're doing. Oh my goodness. That right there, that snippet is going to be the opener to this episode. (laughs) (laughs) We do like a, we do like a little quote sometimes that right there was it. It was, that's something I've been preaching from the hilltops these past two years. And, you know, case in point, um, I know we're wrapping up, but case in point, A PR company reached out to me a couple months ago to hire me to be their corporate sponsorship associate. And basically what that means is like me tracking down corporate sponsors for podcasters. 
Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> Which is cool. And it's like, okay, teach about this. I help podcasters with this stream of income. I did not see this opportunity unfold. It just kind of presented itself to me. Mm-hmm. But you're right. It's so easy to kind of switch or to flip the switch of saying, oh, well, that's not the title that I identify with. And like my ego got in the way of like, but I'm a flute teacher. I'm a, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so at the time I was like, but I don't want to be PR. I don't want, (laughs) (laughs) but my husband said something very valuable. And he said, Heidi, it's not, it may not be your entire like, aha, this is what you're supposed to do. It probably is an opportunity. This is to kind of piggyback off of what you just said so beautifully. It could be a piece to the puzzle. Mm -hmm. If you are working with these gentlemen who think more businessly, who are, you know, have these entrepreneurial skills, the skills that you are honing right now, you are the summation of five people that you hang out with. Yeah. So you might be honing a skill, one skill. It doesn't mean you're less of a flute teacher. It does not mean that you're less of a performer. It does not mean it's an opportunity. That's all it is. Exactly. And like the, the waitressing job, brilliant, genius for going around and saying, yes, I'm serving food, but at the same time, I'm seeing this as an opportunity to connect with potential clients. It's an opportunity for me to connect with people because people they're the bridge to making those possibilities a reality, right? Exactly. And for you just to say, it's so easy for us to say, well, I'm just serving an English muffin. But you saw it much bigger than just English muffin, English muffin and tea. Yeah. You saw it as, huh, I have my business cards. Slip it with the receipts. <laughs> Thank you in advance. <laughs> and that right there, that is genius. And you cannot not do that for yourself. So what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing in that is you're showing up for yourself, mm-hmm. even in the opportunities in the moments where it doesn't seem like it's connected, but it is. It's mm-hmm. all connected. It is. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> I can go off now to the rest of my Monday on this complete <laughs> high because I, oh, yes, you're validating a lot of things that I've been preaching about, talking about, thinking about within my own world. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Because it's just, it's so nice not to feel alone. Yeah. It's nice to have these conversations with like-minded people so you don't feel crazy. (laughs) I think, and I think it's just, you can get bogged down so much and just like, and again, going back into that negative mindset, right. Of just not feeling like you're being, you're succeeding to not feeling like you're not doing it. But then, like you said, there's more people out there than we think that are in the same boat in the same position. And even if the people that we think that are quote unquote making it, really, if you take a look at them, they're still doing something else on the side. You know, no one is just direct anymore. So, hmm. but yeah, so it is, it's, we need to get more of these voices and, and more of these stories because you're right. We can't feel alone and we need to hear more of it. And especially in, in the college setting when we're studying hmm. and getting ready. Yes. As we're planting those seeds, as Mm -hmm. we are in that student mindset of growing and learning about who we are, what we're going to be, who we want to work with. Like, you're right. It is so imperative between that 18, 23, you know, and beyond, like I'm 37, but I'm, (laughs) you're never too old to learn. It's a, it's Mm -hmm. a whole journey, but you're right. Especially in those pivotal early stages. Yeah as you're discovering who you are and you're honing your crafts, I think it is imperative to start planting those seeds Mm -hmm. at an earlier age. Yeah. Yeah. And and taking more opportunities, like some, you know, I remember being in school and and not wanting to go on alternative spring break because I was like, oh, that's not related. I should be practicing or whatever. Mm. But taking all the opportunities that you're given in school to also, you know, just meet other students and, and, you know, like that, the alternative spring break, they were going to Costa Rica, like what a way to meet with people and reach out to the Costa Rica orchestra. There's always a revolving door. Oh, I love that. So if somebody wanted to pick your brain a little bit more, or they wanted to be in touch with you, what's the best way that they can contact you? Yeah, absolutely. So my email, so it is hollanderhorn <laughs> at gmail.com. Um, I thought it'd be catchy. So yeah, I'm always responsive. I'm 
live, breathe. I'm an email alcoholic, except I'm trying, one of my missions this month has been to try and be less on it, which I think I'm doing some of a semi good job on it, but usually I'm, I'm pretty breathe, sleep, my email. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And your website is hollanderhorn.com. Yes. I do like it. It's catchy. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a blessing. And thank you so much. And um, I had a fun time. Me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, awesome. Stephanie. All right. Thank you, Heidi. Hey, thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Remember that 15 minute discovery call, that invitation is for you. I have helped flutists from across the globe really tap into their unique voice on and off the stage. And I want to do the same for you. So whether you need to work on carving your unique path for your musical career, then let's chat. I promise I do not bite. Go to calendly.com slash Heidi K. Begay. That's C-A-L-E-N-D-L-Y dot com slash H-E-I-D-I-K-A-Y-B-E-G-A-Y. I'll talk to you soon, and the link is provided in the show notes below. Thanks! Let's talk about flute!